Welcome to this brand new episode of Cast It to the King. I'm your host, Joshua Mickle, on this glorious Saturday, wonderful kickoff day for the Tennessee Titans when they take on the San Francisco 49ers today. And I look forward to seeing that matchup and see what this new offense and defense looks like for us. And we'll get into a few quick topics today. But first, a little off the cuff. Yesterday, we ha- a few days ago, we just had, I don't know if it was yesterday or if it was Thursday, that the New England Patriots played the Carolina Panthers and they displayed all four of their quarterbacks, Drake May, Brissett, Zappi, and one Tennessee alumni from the University of Tennessee, Joe Milton. And if you uh, look over at the Rich Eisen show, they recently just uploaded a video that I just wanted to play for our amusement today for how much, let's say one Patriot fan is not happy. Uh, so Chris Broussard, uh, who's uh, one of the co-hosts uh, with Rich Eisen on the Rich Eisen show, he's a avid Boston fan, avid Patriots fan, Celtics fan, just Boston, Boston, Boston. And so the topic was broached up with him about, hey, what do you think about Joe Milton? And he gets irked in this whole video because he does not want to go down the road of, if Joe Milton is better than Drake May, then we screwed up with the number three overall pick in the NFL draft. But before, so I just want to get over here and let's play this a little bit of this clip right here. My blood pressure is so high right now. Joe Milton is throwing bazookas. Right? Like I said, running around you know? like Mike Vick back there. You know what I mean? Mike Vick, he was literally playing against us. <laughs> we were out there for the Panthers. You know what? You know what Joe Milton should do today? Today. What's he that? should get fitted for a red jacket. You got, why, why, I'm not? <laughs> why not? Number one on the depth chart, Joe Milton. Stop it. For a red jacket. Give him a Dunkachino and a red jacket. Where are you going? He's, he's going to feel Stop bad it. when Joe Milton goes to the hall. <laughs> when, when Joe Milton's leading you to playoff glory, you're going to feel real dumb about this day, I tell you that. Much. But in all seriousness, Chris, you know this better than anybody else. All of us do. You need a third string quarterback in the NFL these yes. days, man. Yeah. And so. All right. So just a little bit of that right there. So <laughs> you guys are insane. Stop it. <laughs> All right. I will just just something that off the cuff. Let's keep that in mind for those that are avid. Like if you want to tick off or trigger, apparently. Uh, Patriot fans that you may know, just say to them, hey, Joe Milton, six-rounder. When was the last time you had a six-rounder? How'd that turn out for you guys? You should get him fitted for a gold. You should get him fitted for a red jacket. Not a gold jacket, the red jacket for the Patriots Hall of Fame, like Mike Vrabel did last year. What the, yeah, on our bye week. What a selfish man. I Don't go down that road again. Don't go down that road again. Oh, and I want to see if I can try to bring this up here. Uh, yeah, I'll try to bring this up here in just a moment. Deadpool and Wolverine is still out in theaters. And boy, let me just tell you, I've seen this movie now 10 times. I'm not lying to you. I'm not joking with you. I will show you the receipts if you request of them. From Movie Pass. I have seen this movie 10 times, and this movie, Deadpool and Wolverine, continues to be the showstopper and everything of what's going on at Marvel and now go moving forward in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the collective swan song for the old Fox Marvel Legacy movies and other Marvel Marvel Legacy characters that happens there. All right. On to the show today. First topic. Off the cuff right here is this. In case you haven't, in case you've you in case you've been wondering lately, there's been a little show out there that popped up on Disney Plus, and there's a lot of hype going into this show. I was one of those folks that uh was very hyped about it. Uh it was teased to be a dark side leading show to display dark side powers. It was teased to be a show that 
uh, would delve into dark side lore would be from the viewpoint that we haven't seen before. And it would be one of those things where it's like where the villain is your main character and the antagonists are the Jedi or or in this case, the Jedi and the High Republic. We did not get that. We got a murder mystery type of show centered around Jedi, old Padawans, an emo kind of bro looking Sith if you want to call him that, a Sith. We had dangling of keychains over two particular cameos at the end of the show with Darth Plagueis and uh, Yoda at the last episode. And just those dangling of the keys was enough to get some fans online to say, we must have a season two. Look at those. We must explore the Darth Plagueis story, which you should have done to start the season to begin with. Probably <gasps> they introduce Yoda. He, we must see young, younger Yoda in action. After the show was said by the showrunner that he was never going to appear on the show. So bunch of lies, lies. I tell you lies. And so, a recent article, to take this with a grain of salt, comes from an ins- from, comes from a Disney insider. Uh, his name is uh, I want to try qu- quote this guy properly. Uh, I believe his name is Chris Gore, over at the Park Place, and it was and this is a broader topic, but I just want to. And I want to just, uh, this is a broader topic of what he discusses, but this essentially says, like, hey, this is what Kathleen Kennedy, the producer over at Lucasfilm, is saying and all that stuff. And so let me try to find the quote here. And while I try to, uh, yeah, so the quote right here is as follows. Is that, uh, is that we've been hearing that lately Kathleen Kennedy is not very hands-on with the Star with Star Wars at this point. Hollywood scooper, uh, yeah, Hollywood scooper WDW Pro said to Chris Gore on a recent episode of his live stream YouTube show, "Are you hearing anything similar that she may be operating in title only at least for now?" Gore said she wants to retire and leave. But, but she wants to do it on a win. That last line right there. She wants to do it on a win. And so, you have articles like this popping up from the park place. And then you coincide that with what's been happening lately over at Star Wars, we've had underwhelming after underwhelming after underwhelming after underwhelming after underwhelming project on Disney+. Plus. We have not had a movie since The Rise of Skywalker in 2019. A Star Wars movie, no less. Now, the last time they had a movie, uh, less said about that, the better, with uh, Indiana Jones 5. With Indiana Jones 5. And so, just a few days after that, a man named Christian Harloff, and for those you who may not know who Christian Harloff is, I know a little bit of him because I because through Collider and John Campia of like Movie Talk News on YouTube's, uh, I've been like I've known him since like been watching him since uh, I want to say twenty when he was introduced on the AMC show essentially. So that's like that's like around 2013 2014. So a little around 10 years and they've been breaking scoops all up the wazoo. Like they like they know their stuff. They know their stuff. And he, and he like he has sources on the inside and so is John Campia and so do others that are on his that are on their respective shows now. Uh, which they've gone their separate ways after AMC and Collider when all that folded. Uh, they went on to do their different shows. Christian Harloff was said in his recent 
uh, YouTube video on his channel about there's no word uh, where uh, the Acolyte is getting a season two. I don't know how true it is, but I heard about Acolyte. There's no there's no world where it's getting a season two. And he did and he did relay the information that to take it with a grain of salt because again it is just speculation and rumor. And the quote continues here. I heard from somebody that they heard from somebody pretty close inside, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. So take it with a grain of salt. But what I have heard from this particular person is that there's no world where act like gets a season two. And so you and so this article uh, with Christian Harloff uh, and Collider uh, in collaboration, apparently talking about the former future, like the accolades, former future and Leslie. And yeah, there's conversations even before the show that Leslie Hetland, who was the showrunner for this uh, particular show was uh, supposed to like pitch this as a uh, multi seasoned. And she hasn't gotten word on this. She hasn't gotten word on this at all. And so when you want to bring up, and I'm doing this so sloppily. That's not it. Oh, yeah. I'll actually bring this up here, too. I'll actually bring this chart up. There's a particular site right here that rates, like, that does all the streaming and, like, pretty much has locked down what's going on in terms of what's streamed the most. And a lot of defending fans online will say, oh, the accolades topping streaming charts. Like, like it doesn't matter what how, what the fan reaction is. It's, get, it's topping the streaming charts, they say. Well, according to this, it's not. It's not. You got House of the Dragon, which is dominating all the households. You got Bluey at number two. You have Suits. You have The Boys. You have Love Island. You have Dexter. You have Grey's. Grey's Anatomy is still on and still getting views to this day. I remember watching a few seasons with my wife, which was really good. And then Wokeness interfered in the show, and then we stopped watching it. Beverly Hills Cop XLF. Your Honor and Family Guy. Those are your top ten stream. Those are your top ten for streaming. Now, if you want to look over at originals, let's see the following. We got The Boys, Love Island, The Bear, Desperate Lies, Receiver, Vikings, Valhalla, which I hear is a good show. Bridgerton, I've seen one season of that. It's really good. Uh, I don't know how to say that word. I'm sorry. Uh, the Mole and Stranger Things. And the numbers are over here, about minutes watched, and then, yeah, the stream streamers and this site, like gets down, like tracks down like households, in terms of like the verification of it. So yeah, right here for acquired. This is between. This is just after. The season essentially ended. Like when, like they run up to the season in the last episode, essentially. And then you're obviously not going to see it in movies. But over, but in terms of, but in terms of, but in terms of television, right now it's nothing but Olympics, Olympics, Olympics. You don't see it on here. So yeah, we go to stream. Yeah, it's it's you're gonna if you're gonna find Acolyte for in terms of box off like uh, in terms of streaming numbers, you're gonna want to find it on this particular site right here. And let me move my screen out of the way. It's gonna be at this site right here. And then you scroll down. Acolyte's not on site. The only like this is the number one certified numbers for streaming for television shows. And the ones trying to defend the acolyte saying, oh, it's getting big streaming numbers. Where does it come from? It comes from Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes is a verified critic site that, su that submits reviews and scores. They are not known 
in terms of uh, credibility, they are not known for jotting down streaming numbers. They are not known for that. So who am I going to believe? Someone that doesn't have a lot of history or maybe has lackluster history? Or am I going to believe a verified site that's been been in this game for quite a long time? Like when you want to look up box office numbers, you go to Box Office Mojo. You don't go to a random like a random another site and they give you completely different numbers. Box Office Mojo is close to like the real deal. It's close to the real deal. And so here's the article right here, and I'll bring this up over here. So yeah, when we're talking about the acolyte, and and why does this matter? In this conversation here, it matters because when you put the two things together from the Chris Gore supposed scoop and then you put together the thing from Christian Harloff, mm-hmm. Acolyte's not going to get a season two. The show's dead. The show's completely dead. Couple that with the wording from the scooper that Kathleen Kenny will is trying to leave Lucasfilm, but she wants to go out on top. She wants to go out winning the Super Bowl. She wants to go out on a high note. There was rumblings that uh, Indiana Jones 5 was going to be that film. There was rumblings it was going to be that film. And it ultimately was not because it flopped at the box office. And even though it got a majority of critics on Rotten Tomatoes, if I'm not mistaken for a positive review, there's a lot of negative backlash with that film. And so you were going into, so you had that rumbling in the background, like, oh, this is her last film. Lucasfilm is doing Indiana Jones 5. Kathy Kennedy's going to retire. She's going to ride off into the sunset. None of that happens, and she's still there. So why is she still there? If this scoop is to be correct, she's trying to buy her time and try to go off on a high note. And if you couple that quote, supposed quote, with this rumor from Christian Harloff, Kathleen Kennedy is essentially saying to us that the Acolyte is a failure of a show. The Acolyte did not perform to expectations. The Acolyte translation from head honcho of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy, was a disaster. Was a complete and utter disaster. And for those that want to keep trying to defend it until the cows come home, I'm sorry. There's the majority of fans, especially me, this was a breaking point. For most fans, this show was a breaking point. For me, it was. And I will tell you why. When And I discussed this on my Acolyte review. Even before episode 8 came out, and nothing's changed from episode 8. I did my show review after episode 7, and then I was hoping to eat crow after episode 8, th- after seeing that, and say, wow, this is such an amazing show. You know what? I have to do a retract. Like, I need to retract my previous statements. This last episode redeemed the show. No, it did not. It did not change my opinion whatsoever after episode 8. And so for... This show, it it was the breaking point for a lot of people. It was the breaking point for a lot of people. For me, it was the breaking point because when I am told as a consumer, as a customer, when I am told one thing is a particular thing and I get something else completely different, I'm going to be peed off about it. I'm going to be like, hey, you lied. Like, you legitly lied. You legitly lied. Like, you, like, you go to like let's say let's say you're going let's say you're going to a car dealership. You roll up to into the parking lot and you are test driving this particular car that you like the deal like the car dealer the uh the agent there is the car salesman is giving you the best pitch in your life. He's saying these are gonna have all the bugaboos, these are gonna have all the gadgets and trinkets, and then you see it a little bit in action when you test drive it. And then you say, and then you ask him, is this the car that you are describing? And he tells you, and he tells you, yes. You're thinking, great. 
this is fantastic. I can't wait to put down my down payment, purchase it or purchase this off all up front in cash or get on a monthly payment for my for my new brand new car that I'm excited for. Here, and then you're left with this little nugget of Yeah, you get through the payment, you get through all that. Here's your car, sir. It's the same model, it's the same mileage. And then you get in, it doesn't have the touch screen, it doesn't have the sound system, it doesn't have a particular miles per gallon, it doesn't have, it's not a hybrid, it's an actual gasoline car, or for some people that don't uh, like uh, electric cars, it's completely electric, It's there's no gas whatsoever, actually you were pitch it was a hybrid. You get in the car, and then you notice all those bells and whistles are not there. How are you gonna react? You're not gonna be able to get your money back because you signed, you gave him payment. You gave him cash. They're not going to take it back. They're not going to take it back because you're going because they're going to tell you this is what you purchased. Thank you for your money. Have a good day, sir, or have a good day, ma'am. And especially for those that uh, try to buy buying cars on Facebook on the marketplace. So be careful about that. This is how I feel about the acolyte. I was advertised. I was shown a particular thing. I was told a particular thing. And then when I am trying to soak in the content of the viewer, trying to take in this information from the show, I am led to a different conclusion. I am led to the sta- to this complete factual statement. This is not what was advertised. This was not what was advertised as a Sith-based show. It is not. And had the show been advertised as, as what it actually is, then maybe more people would be less than critical of it. But even then, if I mean, even then, if that was the case, the writing in this show is bad. It is completely bad. It is turned down the garbage to like down the garbage toilet bad. The dialogue makes almost no sense. The character motivations in the show make no sense. The uh, smile of Ren makes no sense. Osha and her sister May make no sense, especially May with her back and forth of "I'm going to kill Jedi." Wait, no, I'm going to turn myself in. No, I'm going back to killing Jedi. Second, third, fourth thought, fifth thought, like just popping your head. Why not? If it's written, it happened, deal with it because you're just a stupid viewer of the show and you're still going to watch this no matter what. No more. No more. With me, at least. This show is the show where I have planted firm and it goes down in a previous statement I've made on social media is that once I have seen in live action the new Mufasa movie and the upcoming whenever it gets released... The filmed, it has been filmed, the upcoming live action Lilo and Stitch movie. Those are the two movies where afterwards I have said, I am done with the Disney live action remakes. I am done. I am done. Not even the Aristocats supposed live action movie I will watch because I am just done. I am over Disneyfied live action remake. I am just, it's too, I'm done with it. Like do some original stuff. For the Acolyte, this is where I plant my foot in the ground and I say that I am done. You're not getting my views anymore. You're not getting anything from me. I don't believe you when you say this Ray movie that takes place after the rise of Skywalker is going to come out. I don't believe you. James Mangold, who did Indiana Jones 5, who just criticized... Deadpool and Wolverine for obvious reasons, which we uh, won't go there. You can check out the spoiler reviewed video on this YouTube channel of why that is. James Mangold, who directed Logan in Indiana Jones 5 and 4 v Ferrari, he's supposed to do the origin Jedi story of how the Jedi became to be, of how the Force was discovered. I don't believe you when you say that movie's coming out. We were told we were supposed to get Rangers of the High Republic with Gina Carano. You fire Gina Carano over a social media post, but you won't fire Pedro Pascal over his social media post. So double standard there. That show gets canceled. You announce 
the Rogue Squadron with uh, director Patty Jenkins' fame of Wonder of Wonder Woman fame. Film her on an aircraft carrier with an X-wing fighter on it. Big investor day video I thought was pretty awesome because my dad was in the military and I have a soft spot in my heart with for the military and I respect for what and I have a great respect for what they do. You put that out. That is put on the back burner. We were supposed to get an old Republic series of films or TV shows from Benioff and Weiss of Game of Thrones fame who created the original Game of Thrones show and wrapped that up. Like for those that are wondering why the last season of Game of Thrones before they did the spinoff of House of Dragon, why that last season was so abrupt it is because they wanted to get that out of the way, finish that wrap it into a nice bow that they possibly could so they can get quickly to work on the Star Wars projects that they had lined up to release and add and subs and subsequent years that Avatar wasn't supposed to be released. And those films were supposedly the old Republic with Revan, Malak, Darth Bane. I mean no not Darth Bane. Darth Malgus and a whole bunch of other Sith Lords that you could have tackled and a whole bunch of other Jedi you could have tackled. Those were supposedly the films can canceled after you announce it. There have been multiple instances where we have been told we have been advertised. We have been promised particular things with the studio with Kathleen Kennedy. And it has come to a point where I, as a fan, cannot take it. I can't take it. And I am not going to be sold a false bill of goods. And I'm not falling it for it for the last time. I'm not. You have great shiny moments in Ahsoka, the episode uh, World Between Worlds where you show Anakin Skywalker and remnants of live action Clone Wars was the best episode in the show. The rest of the episodes are forgettable. The rest of the episodes are forgettable in terms of story. Bo Book of Boba Fett, forgettable. The last season of The Mandalorian, season three, subpar compared to how the first two seasons were spectacular in terms of movies since 2019 that's right there are no movies so and Kathleen Kennedy wants to, and some fans of the Kathleen Kennedy one defender say oh she's raped in billions for Disney she can go no wrong with the movies she just entered she just came out with Indiana Jones Lucasfilm came out with Indiana Jones 5 it lost Disney 200 million dollars she also this is not the first time she's lost Disney millions and hundreds of millions of dollars solo lost hundreds of millions of dollars those original directors are supposed to be with Phil Lord and Chris Miller heard of them they've done the Lego movie they've done the Jump Street movies they are the sole creators of the Spider-Verse movies that we all love. They were writing and directing the solo movie. And halfway through, Kathleen Kennedy says, what are by her admission of fault? Because she, they, for her vision, was not being executed from what they supposedly promised her. Or she was inadequate or inept or inept to understand what they originally agreed on gets pulled. The plug gets pulled halfway through production and they have to reshoot almost the entire film. And so you're essentially left with two budgets for one movie, essentially lost Disney hundreds of millions of dollars. So this is, so for those that want to say Kathleen Kennedy rakes in money for Disney. No, that's, technically not true that's technically not true she's lost disney hundreds of millions of dollars it's not oh they just broke even no she they she has had films and her last one which was supposed to be her swan song at lucasfilm has lost millions of dollars for disney indiana jones 5 was supposed to be a steven spielberg directed film he dropped out i remember the year it was it was 2019 he dropped out it was 2019 no, it was like somewhere between 2017, 2018, he dropped out because this film was supposed to be released in 2019. That's how far back you have to go with this. And it finally released last year in 2023. James Mangold 
of Logan fame, of 4v Ferrari fame, directs it. I have not seen it. My dad will say equivalently how much he loathes and hates the ending of the show. I mean, of that movie. And I'll take him at his word. I'll take you at your word. Yeah. I'll take him at his word that the ending of Indiana Jones 5 was bad. Bottom line, until Kathleen Kennedy, the head of Star Wars, is out, she is either fired or she finally retires. And we'll touch on this for a bit here. Until she is out, whether via retirement or by firing. Until she is gone, I am not going to subjugate myself to any more Star Wars. I'm not. I'm not. I got better things to do in my life than torture myself with subpar content that we are promised is going to be really good. And it just comes out, meh. Like, why? Like, this makes no sense. And so now, uh, just zeroing back in on the Acolyte, now with no season two, you're left with a big asterisk of what the heck happens after this. What happens to Quirm? Uh, to Quirm, whatever his name is. What happens to Osha? What happens to May now with the Jedi? What happens with Darth Plagueis? What happens? How does Palpatine go? fall into the mix here? What does Master Yoda, knowing the events of the Acolyte, how does that affect canon now? Because that because this does affect canon. There is going to be a situation where they are going to probably show it like the continuation of this via a book or a comic series. They're not going to do it with a movie. They're not going to do it with a season two. They're going to do this via a comic release or a book release. Mark my words. It's going to be because of that. And so with Kathleen Kennedy, her words from the quote is that she wants to go out with a win. A win commercially and financially. What does that mean? What does that mean? That could mean a whole slew of things. That could mean if a film reaches a particular, like if a film reaches 90 plus percent, you clear the mark for the amount of critics that she thinks is to her standard. When it's a commercial success at the box office, what does that mean? Does that mean making over a billion? Does that mean making close to two billion like the first uh, new Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens, did? Does that mean you're $200, $300 million above the break-even point? What does that mean? And so if this quote is true, we are left dangling. We are left here dangling by the words of a woman where... She's not going to leave. She's just going to keep throwing these bones out there, it seems like. If the quote is true, she's keep she's going to keep throwing the bones out there of, hey, I hear you. I want to leave too. I don't want to be here forever. forever. I'm like 70-something years old. I want to retire from this. I don't want to do this forever. But I want to do it going out on top. I want to do it going out on top. To which... If you are Disney, if the, whenever it comes out, I say, if there is no Star Wars movie out by the year 28, like 2028, if there is no new Star Wars film out by the year 2028, and we're in 2024 right now. If there's no new film out by then, you have gone nine years with no new Star Wars movie. That should be unacceptable to Disney 
and stroll her down to the offices of like, hey, like to the offices with the stockholders, Bob Iger and the other head honchos there, Disney, stroll her in there and say, hey, where's like, where's what you promised? Where's the movies? Where's the stuff that's supposed to make us money? As a stock, if I'm a stockholder of Disney, <coughs> if I'm a stockholder of Disney, I'm going to be like, hey, what are you doing? The TV shows don't really help us make money. The movies help us make money that allow us to make these TV shows. Even though Disney Plus has finally turned a profit, they had to do X amount of different price hikes to finally get there and allow ads onto their streaming uh, pro, uh, service finally. If I'm a stockholder, if I am Bob Iger, I'm asking where, like, what have you done? What have you done? And the one film you did do after Rise of Skywalker, we were bleeding money. We, ha- we lost money on that film. We lost a lot of money. What have you done for us that should constitute you still having a job here right now? What have you done to constitute you still standing before us and you walking out those doors with a job? What have you done? Those talks, I think, honestly, you should have right now. Don't wait until four years. Don't wait three years, two years, next year. Do what you should do. They should be doing this right now. If not right now, they should be doing this in Jan- like after the new year, in January 2025. They need to roll her up in there and say, what have you done? Where are the goods? You promise us movies, you make announcements, and then you cancel them or they're long delayed. They never come out. So what is it? What is your excuse? Because you will have defenders out there saying that, and coming from Steven Spielberg, who is one of the greatest directors in Hollywood, still defend her and say she is one of the greatest Hollywood producers of all time. Take that what you will. If you look at her resume, she has a lot of Steven Spielberg films on her resume, so that certainly helps if you want to be a critic about it. She's definitely have, and she also has other films on her resume without Steven Spielberg that are called classics as well. So for those that want to say, oh, she's only with Steven Spielberg, that's not entirely true. So as a producer at large, for individual projects. She may be good at what her job is, but she is not a good head of a company. She is not a good Kevin Feige, where he is a producer and he is managing all of these projects within a movie studio. She is not good at this. And it's time, if it if no one has admitted it, it they need to admit it. She is not good at this and she needs to be and she needs to be let go. She needs to step aside and stroll someone else in there to lead the company and do a hard reset of this franchise. A hard reset where with Star Wars, it's unique. Where Star if this was Marvel or DC, and DC's going through this right now, they're doing a hard like they're doing a reboot of their universe. That's their reset. That's their reset. Marvel is in a in a position where they are in the process of possibly doing a reset after Avengers Secret Wars comes out, where it's supposedly going to be like a re like a quasi reset, quasi reboot of the Marvel Cinematic Universe going forward after that with one singular timeline. With Star Wars, you have centuries, decades, millennials, like millennial of years of story to tell. A wide galaxy. A heart reset for Star Wars looks like this. You get away from the Skywalker era. You get away from the time period of between episode one and episode nine. Between the Phantom Menace and the Rise of Skywalker. You get away from that. You either do the following. You fast forward 200 plus some odd years into the future after episode nine. Or you dial it back and go to like hundreds or thousands of years into the past with the old republic. You do one of those two things. You either do that with the past or you go greatly into the forward present. 
Those are the two things you got to be doing if you're the new head of Lucasfilm. You have to do the hard reset. And that means fo- pick a timeline. Future or past. If you're going past or you're going future, all of our shows and particularly all of our movies are going to be... There's a fly here. I'm in the garage. I got new seats and I got new speakers. So hopefully there's not a reverb that's on the on the hearing for this show. Anyways, that's my ADD kicking in. Where you, it's the future or the past that you pick. Pick one. Have all your shows dedicated and all your movies dedicated within this time period. Create a new story that will at least last you a decade or two decades worth of films and TV shows. And then once that's done, you can go into the future or go even deeper into the past and maybe delve into the stories of the birth of the Force, the birth of the Jedi, the formation of the Sith, or tackle the future that you didn't tackle with the hard reset initially because you chose Old Republic. Go 200, 300 years into the future. What happened with that? What happened with the generations after Rey establishes the new Jedi Order? There are so many ways you can do this. And they need to make the change right away and say Kathleen Kennedy needs to be tossed. She needs to go or we need to fire her. That's that. And now to close out this show right here is this right here. Where have you heard this before? Analyst, football expert says, Titans are suckatude. Titans can't be good. Will Levis is not that quarterback. Will Levis is in trouble. Will Levis, he better watch his back because Mason Rudolph, of all people, could steal his starting job. Look, watch out. Mason Rudolph is a serviceable quarterback. Where have we heard this before? And here we go again because it has popped up again by one Ryan Fowler of Bleacher Report ranking his quarterbacks of who is in the high st- and like he, in the article he says in the high stakes landscape that is the NFL. The following quarterbacks that are, are that are in danger of losing their jobs. And at number seven, he has Will Levis. And the quote goes as follows. With new head coach Brian Callahan in the building, the onus is on Will Levis to elevate the Tennessee Titans, which is true. Levis showed flashes last year, including a four-touchdown debut against the Atlanta Falcons. However, he came down to earth as the season wore on, finishing the year ranked 24th in QBR among signal callers with at least nine appearances. He also threw for as many touchdowns in his final eight games combined as he did the October afternoon debut versus Atlanta. Now, if you are a Titans fan, and if you have been watching the games, you know why. You know why that is. Play calling, head coach, bad offensive line, receivers that can't catch, that's not named DeAndre Hopkins. Where have we seen this before? These guys are box score warriors right here. The quote continues. With Levis, was Levis expected to be the surefire starter for the long call, general manager Rand Carthon aggressively sought to improve the offense around his young quarterback this offseason. Tennessee splurged on the likes of running back Tony Pollard Center, Lloyd Cushenberry, and why not T- Tyler Boyd, who is supposed to be our third wide receiver on our roster, and add J.C. Latham with the seventh overall pick in the NFL draft. The team also agreed to terms of wide receiver Calvin Ridley from the Jacksonville Jaguars. The new surrounding talent will make life easier on Will Levis. Yes, it will, especially at our offensive line. Read your own quotes. But it, and and it continues here, but it'll be on the second-year quarterback to utilize his offense correctly. Veteran, yeah, veteran backup Mason Rudolph sits in the wings with 14 career starts under his belt. Now, if you have been watching the show, there was this old hack of a woman that's a Cowboy fan that said that Will Levis is in danger of losing his job to Mason Rudolph because she thinks that if the Titans start 1-3, and three, the Titans are going to make the switch over to Mason Rudolph, which is the most ridiculous, stupid thing I can ever ha- like that I could ever think of for... Like for this particular thing, because Mason Rudolph, 
What did he do in Pittsburgh? Please, I ask anyone, I ask anybody, show me what he has done in Pittsburgh that should convince me that he should be the starting quarterback over Will Levis. There's nothing, nothing out there to suggest the fact that he should be better, that he should be war, quarterback one over Will Levis. Will Levis would have to go a stat line. He would, I mean, he would have to be so bad. He would have to be Jamarcus Russell bad to forfeit this starting quarterback job in Tennessee because this season they are giving him the full season. They are giving him the full season. And as I bring up the and as I bring it up over here from Bleacher Report. They are giving him the full season as a starting quarterback. They are giving him the full season to which they're going sh- they're essentially saying to him, "Hey, you don't have a fifth year option. You showed flashes last year. We know what went wrong last year. The offensive line was hot garbage. Andre Dillard, Andrew Brewer, bye-bye. Thank God you're not with us. See ya." We had wide receivers that can't catch the ball. Insert Calvin Ridley. Insert Tyler Boyd into the fray. We had a defense that kept bending and breaking and bending and breaking. Christian Fulton, bye-bye. Enjoy your life in Charger land. And Trey Avery, you are thankfully no longer our starting cornerback. Thank the Lord. And now with and now with uh, Quandre Diggs signing him from Seattle, uh, thank the Lord. Elijah Molding is not the free safety anymore. Thank the good Lord he is not free safety anymore. Insert Lejeria Sneed. Insert Chido Awuzie. Insert Roger McCreary. Him and Sneed were top five corners in touchdowns allowed in 2023. I will take my chances with this secondary. Insert into the nose tackle. Trev- like Trevor, like... I man, I'm ha- man, I'm getting so hyped. Sweat, the rookie, the rookie defensive tackle, second rounder out of Texas. He's been getting slack uh, from what happened in the off season, and for his weight, what we have seen in training camp against the All Pro Lloyd Cushenberry. Treat him like a pile of rocks. So I imagine, and this, and this reaffirms my, my prediction. That we are going to win against Miami just on the one sole reason alone. Who is their new center? It's Andrew Brewer. It's I mean it's Aaron Brewer who is at best at best he is two hundred and seventy five pounds. Man, I, why do I call myself a Titan fan? What's his name? I want to get his name right. Travandre Sweat. Is his name Travandre? I need to keep saying that over and over and over again. He's going to be lined up across Aaron Brewer that Dolphins game, and he is listed at a staggering 362 pounds. He's got almost a hundred pounds more than Aaron Brewer. You are going to get mold you are going to get obliterated Tua I hope you I hope you survive this game I don't wish ill will but for the sake of your own safety you should say to your head coaches before the game hey that dude over there he's got 100 more pounds than my center right now can we sub out the center just just for this one game just for this one game can we have a different center please please thank you I don't want to die again like I did in Cincinnati essentially I don't want to go through that again I don't want to be injury prone after you guys just paid me a crap load of money oh my god that contract that Tua just got oh my lord which will give Will Levis some more motivation because he is set if he has a good year he's going to be the first ever 200 million dollar pay player in Titans history Ryan Tannehill was the first ever 100 million dollar player in the franchise history Will Levis is about to double that by 100 million to be 200 million. Now, you can go through the list of improvements on this roster. The coaching has improved. We have a better play caller, and we look like to have a better defensive coordinator than we've had in years past with Denard Wilson when he was the DB's coach and 
Baltimore last year, which they were balling like crazy. And in Philadelphia when they had their Super Bowl won and the year before with uh, Jalen Hurts. Everything is all set for Will Levis. And we have seen from Will Levis last year that winning given the opportunity to be good, when he is good, and when the protection doesn't break down, when his defense is playing well, he doesn't have to bail them out like he did against Miami. He is not like he's not bad. He's good. He's good. He's great. He is close to borderline great. His deep touch on the ball is something to behold. Patrick Mahomes esque. That's how beautiful his deep throw accuracy is. And I expect man, if they come out this uh, preseason game tonight versus the 49ers and Will Levis like throws a haul of a ball deep to Calvin Ridley or uh, Tyler Boyd or or to get the fans excited, uh, Traylon Burks for a deep touchdown. There is going to you cannot you cannot contain it. You cannot deny it. This offense is going to be game busters. Awesome to watch this year in the NFL season. And so, barring Will Levis suffering a catastrophic season-ending injury or him looking as bad as Jamarcus Russell, he is not coming out. He is not getting benched. Mason Rudolph is going to ride that bench, or you better watch out for Malik Willis if he performs well in preseason. Mason Rudolph may be subjugated to third quarterback again. Ironic, because that's what he's been in Pittsburgh all these years. But I digress. But I digress. Mason Rudolph is going to be riding that bench and keeping that seat warm for himself. He's going to be the bench warmer. He is not going to be seeing the field. Will Levis is going to be given the full season to show the Titans organization, are we going to give you a contract extension or are we searching for our new quarterback going forward? That's ultimately what 2024 is going to be. And if any indication from last year is any indication for this year, Will Levis is going to take that next step going forward. There is no game this past season where he was the reason we lost. There is no game where he was the reason we lost. Zero. None. It was because of our O-line or our defense. That's it. Or in the Col- or in the case of the Colts game in Nashville, our special teams. Our special teams. There is not one game you can point me to, and if you want to be technical and be a box score warrior and say, he threw the game losing interception versus Pittsburgh in his second start. He didn't win the game for the Titans. There's He lost the game for them in the final seconds of the game. Oh, there's the proof he's not perfect. What happened before the game? Context is key to everything. They had the drive before, or two drives before. They have a kickoff return to the 50-yard line. The 50. And they run it for three straight plays. They don't throw it. And then for the fourth and three, or whatever it is, for the manageable, they throw a deep shot to Traylon Burks. Didn't get it. Turnover on downs. We could have just done a check down at Kyle Phillips. Or NWI or whoever it was, Chris Moore, whoever was our wide receivers at the time. You could have done that. You don't. We we're done with Tim Kelly. He's out. Mike Frabel is game management. He's out. Insert Brian Callahan and his play calling that he did with Joe Burrow, which by the way was really good last night, Chad, because that team went to a Super Bowl a few years ago. So that's better than what we've been through the last few five years, six years, past decade. And a, and a half with the Titans since 2010, since I was an avid fan for a long time. I remember my 2008 season, freshman year in high school. I thought we were winning the Super Bowl. We get the number one seed. We get obliterated, shoot ourselves in the foot multiple times versus the Ravens. Yes, it was rainy. Yes, if you want to have that little bit of an excuse. But you still turn the ball over like five or six times. Some of them, Half of them in the red zone, no less, with fumbles. Oh my good oh my goodness gracious. You choke versus the Bengals in the playoffs. You choke in the 
playoffs versus the Bengals with Ryan Taylor's three interceptions and one of them being on a predictable play call. One of them being on a predictable play call. You also lose that game because Mike Vrabel, why do you do this? You go for two points after scoring the game's first touchdown. Why? That one point could have been helpful for you. That one point, you're not driving it down the field to try to kick a field goal to win. You're holding on to the ball to drain the clock and to host your first ever, ever, first ever AFC Championship game in Nashville. You're doing that, but no, because of your stupid freaking play calling, like game management decisions, we were in, we were placed in that situation. And then Ryan Tannehill, unfortunately, throws his third interception when he threw into triple coverage. And so that led to that right there. The game versus the Ravens in Nashville uh, in 2020. Why are you punting in enemy territory? Why? Why? 2019 AFC Championship game. You're riding this high with Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill being the game manager and throwing nice, beautiful balls versus the Patriots and the Ravens. You get to the Chiefs. You're up seven. You go up on them 17, whatever it was. Your defense has them on the edge. Your defense has them on their heels. And Wesley Woodyard and other Titans have come out and said, Mike Vrabel t- stole play calling duties from DMPs. From DMPs. And what happened? The Chiefs hang 30 on us. 30! And we lose the game. We don't score another point, I believe, for the rest of the game. If we did, we scored one more touchdown with tw- and we got 24 points. This is a new era in Tennessee. Gone with the old, in with the new. And I am looking forward, and if tonight Will Levis gets injured or several key players get injured and they're out for the year, then everything I have said today is moot and irrelevant. But going forward, this is going to be a team to be watching for. Do not sleep on this Titans team. Do not take them for granted. Just like all the analysts kept saying, oh, don't take the Mike Vrabel toughness team of the Titans for granted. You should be doing the same for this team because you have a much improved defense. You have a much improved offense. You have a better offensive play caller. Everything that the Titans were in 2023 going 6 and 11. 6 and 11? Yeah, 6 and 11. Everything. You do a checklist. The only thing that they did not get better at is at running back when they let Derrick Henry walk in free agency to the Ravens, which we could have traded to the Ravens last year for a conditional fourth or third round pick. But no, Mike Vrabel and company wanted to keep him around. So yeah, there's the third round pick we could have used uh, this year. But I digress. Again, but I digress. You go, you have a checklist. Where did they get better at? Like, Compared to 2023 and 2024, every single bat box is checked off of the areas of concern. It is checked off. Except for running back. That's the one thing that you can say, uh, Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears compared to Derrick Henry, like on an individual basis, yeah, they're not good. I mean, they're not as good as Derrick Henry, so that's coming like like a didn't improve or they kind of died, they kind of gotten bad at that position there is nowhere on this roster where they got worse nowhere you cannot have that you cannot have an x next to the next to the box of a particular category position and say wow they got worse they got worse than they did last they got worse from last year and for those that want to say Danico Autry is a big loss for us Danico Autry was Stat was stat piling for the last part of the regular season. And as much as Harold Landry uh, really came on late in uh, 2023 after recovering from a busted ACL, I believe, and missed the prior season, he had a slow start in 2023. And then he ended the season with 10 and a half sacks. A lot of those sacks came against the Miami Dolphins. Now, kind of like my defense of Bud Dupree, Harold Landry was 
making quarterbacks lives miserable he was the reason anthony richardson missed the entire season because of his stop defensively and so going forward the tennessee titans for 2024 have gotten better on virtually every single category from the positions on offense from the coaching the offensive line coach is now one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL, and Bill Callahan. If we weren't going to get Mike Munchak, Bill Cal- Bill Callahan was going to be my second like, like name in the hat that I wanted to draw for dream picks for offensive line coaches. We have a better, I mean, we have a different strength and conditioning personnel this year. We will see how they do come this season because this injuries are starting to rack up a little bit in training camp and if we have the same issue if we have the same issue with injuries like we have the past few seasons then there needs to be a divine intervention there needs to be a divine intervention in that organization in that tra- in that training facility like bring the best meditators bring the best spiritual christian leaders in there bring Aaron Rodgers is uh like retreat from d- retreat and darkness, uh, folks, bring everybody in there to smell out whatever voodoo is in that building, supposedly, that's still causing injuries. If there is a black cat in that building, kill it and send it to the pound or send it to the pound or kill it, wherever way you want to do it. Do what you got to do. I mean, I mean, that last part, I mean, with, yeah, all. Oh. All hearsay, but all right, we will end the show right there, and hopefully today's is going to be a satisfying day seeing Will Levis and company versus the San Francisco 49ers on offense, and I am intrigued to see what this offense looks like going forward. And again, all of this could be moot if injuries start piling up at key positions, if Will Levis gets an ACL or busted ankle, God forbid if that happens, then everything is open season for the Titans, essentially. Everything's open season of whether how many losses they can accumulate and get a top draft pick, essentially. We are not at that stage. We are at a stage where Will Levis does not have injury issues. The only reason he got injured was because of busted O-line play. That's just a fact. He's not injured because he's reckless, as some people will say. He is not injured because he can't protect himself. He is injured because of bad offensive line play. That's fact. And with that, I will close out the show by saying this. My name is Joshua Mickle. And as always, before I say that, before I say the last lines, if you haven't subscribed, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And like this video, give us a thumbs up and comment below. Am I, are any of my takes today skeptical? Wrong? What do you think about the acolyte and Kathleen Kennedy? Did her quote indicate uh, involuntarily that, hey, the acolyte was bad? Or do you, or comment below of what do you think about Kathleen Kennedy of her possible leaving Lucasfilm? Or will she leave Lucasfilm? And then also... On today's topic of the Titans, what do you think their record's going to be this year? Comment below and let me know your thoughts. And with that, keep kicking it to the king.